Good morning, everybody. It's great to see everybody out this morning. <coughs> uh, in, let's see. Yeah. in way of announcements this morning, Good morning, Michael. <laughs> Thank you, Van. <laughs> um, good morning. Um, in order of service this morning, uh, Brother Jonathan Maxwell will be conducting our opening prayer. Our closing prayer will be by Brother David Mullins. Uh, Brother Joe Jackson, who has made a pretty well recovery, he will be doing our uh, Lord's Supper this morning. And then if you'd like to go ahead and mark the scripture reading, it will be John chapter 3, verses 12 through 17. John chapter 3, 12 through 17. Uh, on the sixth list, we got pretty a pretty lengthy list, so bear with me. I'll try to get through this as quick as possible. Um, Kenny Anderson is sick. Uh, he's found out this morning that he has got COVID, so keep him in your prayers. Um, also, my mom is feeling a little bit under the weather as well, so keep her in your prayers. Um, in better news, um, my cousin Lexi had her baby Friday. Um, William Lee Atkins was born December 21st. Um, he weighed 8 pounds and 14 ounces, I believe. So they are doing pretty well, and if you've seen any of the pictures, he looks just like Billy. So, um, so it's glad to have that addition to the family. Um, Greg and Laura Lincoln are out sick, and then talking to Miss Linda before services, she told me that her brother-in-law, James Sills, who was just diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. Uh, so keep that family in your prayers as they start this journey, and to try to see what the options are for them. Um, also, we have Linda Ham is sick as well with uh, Jim and Sandy Ator. Uh, if I heard correctly, I think Jim had it first and then as a Christmas gift gave it to Miss Sandy. So uh, keep them in your prayers. And then Pam Boyd's brother-in-law, Rick Boyd, is also out sick. So quite a bit. I'm sure there's probably some more that we're missing, but uh, keep everybody in your prayers this time of year because it looks like a lot of people will be spending Christmas sick. Um, in other business, um, last Wednesday it got announced that we were not meeting tonight. That was actually a error. We will be meeting tonight at 6 o'clock. Um, so if you are able to come back out this evening, um, we'll be meeting at 6. And then I have just a few cards to read real quick. Um, this one says, Dear Church Family, thank you all so much for the food basket. Your thoughtfulness meant so much uh, from Sister Susie Shelton. And then uh, says, thank you for the basket. We appreciate it so much. Barry and Glenda Howell. And then one last card. It says, thanks for the beautiful fruit basket and thanks for the ones that delivered it. You are all special and we love you. In Christian love, Joyce and Chase. Uh, oh, yep. All right. And then one more that got pointed out to me. It says, thank you so much for the gift basket. It was so thoughtful and everything included so joyful. We do appreciate it and everything you do, Wilton and Miss Ann Cherry. All right. Um, I believe that is everything I've got. If there was anything that we missed, please get with either Terrence Van. I think Jeff said he would be out tonight. So just get it with somebody and we'll make sure we get it announced tonight. I'll turn it over to Brother Jeff. Well, we've only got one birthday this week, me. So, so I made it through another year, so that's good. So hopefully many more. But happy, happy, but thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. Happy birthday to me. Um, and I don't know of any anniversaries, but Merry Christmas to everybody. At this time, we'll have our opening prayer. Let us pray. Gracious, most heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you for this glorious day, Lord, that we could come and worship you. Lord, we ask that we do everything manner and pleasing to you, Lord, this day of worship. Lord, we ask that you be with those listed uh, sick today that couldn't join us, Lord. We ask that you bring them back to health, Lord. We ask that you bring them back to their families, Lord, that, that they'll be able to enjoy the holidays. Maybe they can reflect on the blessings that you've been given to us throughout the year. And, years in past, Lord. 
Lord, we also pray that you be with uh, ones that aren't able to be with their families this year. Lord, that they they have a, a time that they can reflect on their uh, their families and blessings, Lord. Lord, we ask that you uh, be with us in everything you do, Lord. And forgive us where we fail you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. First song will be Beautiful Star of Bethlehem. Oh, beautiful star of Bethlehem, shining afar through shadows dim, giving a light for those who long have gone, and guiding the wise men on their way unto the place where Jesus lay. Beautiful star of Bethlehem, shine on. Oh, beautiful star of Bethlehem, shine upon us until the glory dawn. Oh, give us thy light to light the way into the land of perfect day. Beautiful star of Bethlehem, shine on. Oh, beautiful star, the hope of light, guiding the pilgrim through the night, over the mountain till the break of dawn. And into the light of perfect day, it will give out a lovely ray. Beautiful star of Bethlehem, shine on. Oh, beautiful star of Bethlehem, shine upon us until the glory dawn. Oh, give us thy light to light the way into the land of perfect day. Beautiful star of Bethlehem, shine on. Oh, beautiful star, the hope of rest, for the redeemed, the good, the blessed. Yonder in glory when the crown is won. Jesus is now that star divine, brighter and brighter he will shine. Beautiful star of Bethlehem, shine on. Oh, beautiful star of Bethlehem, shine upon us until the glory dawn. Give us thy light to light the way into the land of perfect day. Beautiful star of Bethlehem, shine on. Oh, beautiful star of Bethlehem, shine upon us until the glory dawn. Give us thy light to light the way into the land of perfect day. Beautiful star of Bethlehem, shine on. Our next song will be The Family of God. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I've been washed in the fountain, cleansed by his blood. Join heirs with Jesus as we travel this side. For I'm part of the family the family of God. You will notice we say brother 
and sister round here. It's because we're a family and these folks are so near. When one has a heartache, we all share the tears and rejoice in each victory in this family so dear. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I've been washed in the fountain, cleansed by his blood. Join heirs with Jesus as we trap this side, for I'm part of the family, the family of God. From the door of an orphanage to the house of the king, no longer an outcast, a new song I sing. From rags unto riches, from the weak to the strong. I'm not worthy to be here, but praise God I belong. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I've been washed in the fountain, cleansed by his blood. Join heirs with Jesus as we travel this side, for I'm part of the family, the family of God. This time we'll have our prayer for the offering. Would you bear with me for give thanks? Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning. We thank you for this beautiful Lord's Day. We thank you for the privilege we have this morning to assemble here and, and praise you. We thank you for every blessing of life. We know that everything comes from you. We thank you for our jobs and the earnings we receive, that we have the things that we need here on this earth. We pray now as we give back a portion to you, that we do so in a way that's pleasing self on thy side. In Jesus' name, amen. Him to help us prepare our minds for the Lord's Supper will be, I will sing of my Redeemer. <clears throat> I will sing of my Redeemer and his wondrous love to me. On the cruel cross he suffered from the curse to set me free. Sing, oh, sing of my Redeemer. With his blood he purchased me. On the cross he sealed my pardon, paid the debt, and made me free. Tell the wonder 
a story how my lost is state to save in his boundless love and mercy he the ransom freely gave sing oh sing of my redeemer with his blood he purchased me on the cross he sealed my pardon paid the debt and made me free i will sing of my redeemer and his heavenly love to me he from death to life hath brought me son of god with him to be sing oh sing of my redeemer with his blood he purchased me on the cross he sealed my pardon paid the debt and made me free please turn your bibles to john 3 12 through 17 john 3 12 through 17 if I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended to heaven but he who came down from heaven, that is, the Son of Man who is in heaven. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Let us give thanks for the bread. <clears throat> Dear Heavenly Father, we thank thee for this bread, which represents the broken body of the Son as he hang on the cross. Pray now that we partake of this. We do so in a way pleasing separate to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's give thanks for the cup. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this cup. It represents the blood of the shed of your Son on the cross for us. Once again, we pray that we would take of this and where it's pleasing, step on thy side. In Jesus' name, amen.
Our next song will be I'm Going That Way. If you would please stand while we use this song. <clears throat> I've heard of a land of joy and peace and wonderful light. A beautiful place, a mansion's fair and skies ever bright. Where all who obey the Savior dear forever shall stay. And having been saved by grace divine, I'm going that way. I'm going that way. I'm going that way. And Jesus the Savior I adore is with me each day. I'm clinging to him and never to stray. Yes, singing his praises all day long. I'm going that way. The glorious news I tell and sing as onward I go. That those who are still astray in sin, my Savior may know. I want them to sing his praise above some beautiful day. For glory to him. For me, I'm going that way. I'm going that way. I'm going that way. And Jesus, the Savior I adore, is with me each day. I'm clinging to Him and never to stray. Yes, singing His praises all day long. I'm going that way. I know I shall meet him at the gate when trials are past. I know I shall meet him face to face in glory at last. And though I believe that when we meet, well done he will say. For trusting his soul, redeeming love, I'm going that way. I'm going that way. I'm going that way, and Jesus the Savior I adore is with me each day. I'm clinging to him and never to stray, yes, singing his praises all day long. I'm going that way. Good morning. Before we dive into our lesson this morning, I wanted to just share a, a quick update because for the last few weeks we've been asking for a, a food donation specifically for our, our Christmas meal giveaway. And I wanted to share with you guys that on Friday, uh, this, this couple days ago, we delivered eight meals to local families and then we took five more uh, to the Barker's Mill Church in Clarksville for them to distribute to families and members of the church who was affected by some of the tornadoes a couple weeks ago. So that's a total of 13 uh, families that just uh, we were able to help out just over the last couple of weeks. So uh, I, I think that's pretty awesome. This is something that we have not exactly done before. And we originally planned on 10 to 15. We weren't really sure how it was going to go. Uh, I think next year we could probably shoot for maybe even more. That's my hope with a little bit better planning maybe and uh, a little bit planning ahead. We could maybe shoot for 20 to 25 families. But I just I wanted to share with you guys because... Uh, I was really excited when someone first brought the idea up to me, and I'm glad it went as well as it did. And I hope as a church we'll just continue to look for opportunities like that to, to share God's love and carry out his mission to the nation. So, and I have somewhat of a confession to make. Uh, it's somewhat embarrassing, especially for someone who lives in Stewart County, Tennessee. And you may or may not know this about me, but I actually don't know a whole lot about fishing. I would say I don't know how to fish, but it's not exactly a complicated process. You kind of just cast and wait. So I guess the more accurate statement would be this. I'm not very good at it. I don't know how to fish well. It's probably half a dozen times that I've been fishing in my whole life. And as I've come to understand, it's rather popular in this neck of the woods. So I'm very open to going and learning. But I suspect at the end of the day, I'm probably just not going to enjoy it as much as you would. Because I'm not very good... I haven't done it a whole lot, and, and truth be told, it just wasn't something we did a lot growing up. Um, there's, there's not a lot of natural bodies of water in the lakes we have by us in Texas you don't want to go fishing in. 
And so I, I just don't have those, those childhood memories of like the long weekend fishing trips. You know, I, I never learned the ins and outs of the, the shower and the deep water by the bank and, and all of that. And since it's not something I did a whole lot growing up, it's not something I just naturally enjoy very much as an adult. And if I'm going to be in a boat all day, I prefer it to be moving, for one, uh, preferably quickly. That's how I like to spend my time on the water. But that's another story for another time. And so if you ask me to go with you, I probably will. But I, I won't be very good because, like I said, I just really don't know what I'd be doing. And if you'll forgive my hard left turn, I think, I think a lot could be said about some of us when it comes to worship. Is we do it because that's what everyone around us does. We go because someone told us that's what you're supposed to do, and so you'll go with people. And maybe our parents taught us about it, maybe not. And so sometimes we go, and when we go, we, maybe we just don't really know what we're doing. Or we know what we do. We, we know that someone's going to pray. We know that somebody's going to sing. We know we're going to eat weird bread in tiny cups. But we're not really sure what all this means because no one really sat us down and taught us. And, and maybe your experience is different. Maybe your parents did have deep spiritual conversations with you on, on what it means to worship and, and how to please God and how to seek Him. But I'm going to guess there's a good chance that you kind of just did it because people brought you with them, whether they're family or friends. But, but no one really sat down and taught you what it means. And I say all that because when it comes time to raise up our own children, then we're not really sure how to handle it because no one taught us. And so I think in many times in our lives, someone, as we were an adult, when we were an adult, someone sat us down and said, this is what you do, this is when you go, this is how you do it, and that was kind of that. But regardless of your exact spiritual upbringing or what those conversations might look like for you, I think raising up children is one of the most difficult challenges a Christian family grapples with, is raising up children in the faith. I think one of the things that makes it so difficult is there's, there's no exact guidelines. There's no owner's manual, as my parents were fond of telling me growing up, not that I was problematic or anything. But there's, there's no playbook, right? There's, that, that's the letter of the church that we'd really like, right? Where Paul says, if you do this, if you do this, if you do this, don't do these things. But if you do this enough time, God promises your children will grow up to be faithful Christians. Boy, that would be wonderful. That's not really how it works, is it? It's not that simple. It's not that easy. Usually in my Sunday morning lessons, I kind of pick one passage and we'll dive into it, but we're going to jump around a little bit this morning. And we're going to talk about this idea of raising up children. And one of the reasons we're going to kind of jump around is because, like I said, there's not one passage or one catch-all verse that I think just completely and perfectly addresses uh, this issue in this context, especially just in the, in the context of all the, the modern-day problems we kind of face. And whenever I think about this, maybe you're in the same boat as I am, but I, I want to start with one of the very first verses I think of on this issue. And it's not a promise, but it is a proverb, which if you were in our Bible study classes in the morning is, is really not a promise at all. It's kind of a guiding principle. But I think it's a good starting point for thinking about this idea of understanding godly wisdom on the subject of raising up children. It's from Proverbs 22.6. Train up a child and the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. If I've learned anything in my very few years of parenting, it is that whatever you're teaching your sons or your daughters when they're younger, that is how you can expect them to be as they grow up. And as you probably know yourself, even teaching when it comes to kids is a very complicated topic. Because never in anything else is what you do more important than what you say. Uh, I, in fact, just, just this morning, for I don't really know why, because we've never told him to do this, as soon as I set down the empty communion cup, my son picked it up and tried to drink it. It was empty. The top was not on. He doesn't know anything about the blood and body of Christ. We haven't had that conversation quite yet. He just sees that we do, and he's like, oh, this is what you do with these little cups. And so, as anyone with, with toddlers and little kids running around knows, it's a thousand times more about what you do than what you say. I can sit down and tell my children to, to, to be quiet, sit there, and eat vegetables. But if I eat my dinner with fried chicken and M&Ms while I'm running around the house doing a bunch of different things, guess how they're going to want to eat dinner? <laughs> they're going to want fried chicken and M&Ms, and they're going to run around the house the whole time they're doing it. And again, this is, this is one of those things that I think we, we understand kind of in the realm of life 
and of parenting, but for whatever reason, sometimes it's hard to sort of bridge over to applying it to the church. And I say that because I've had conversations with parents who, who talk about how hard it is to get their, their teenager, their middle school, or their high school to, to pay attention during church. And one of my first questions usually is, well, what do you do during church? And they say, well, sometimes I'm, I'm checking emails, or I'm getting texts, or I'm getting notifications, or, or sometimes I'm trying to follow the Bible app on my phone, but I get these other things popping up, and I'm like, well, what are you, what are you teaching your kids? You know, not what, you, not what are you telling them, but what are you, what are you showing them? And so, you know, are we, are we praying during prayer? Are we singing during worship? Or is our mind somewhere else half the time? And then we don't understand why our kids aren't paying attention either. But we need to be aware, I guess is what I think of what I take away from this verse, that we, we need to be intentional about training children in the things of their faith that are important. Because how we train them up in the way that they will go is how they will follow it when they get older. And again, when we talked about this particular, we actually isolated out this verse when we studied Proverbs, that this is not a promise it's a good guiding principle, it's a good starting point. That, that we need to make the time to train children on why we worship the way we worship. On, on how we worship, on the importance of gathering together, on our, our mental and our emotional approach when we gather together. On how we prepare for Sundays. Kind of the why and the how of it, not just that we should. I was reading a book on, on parenting in the church and it mentioned that parents are often intimidated by the process of discipling their children. And as I was reading that, I was thinking about it, that we, we all know Jesus said, go into the world and make disciples of all nations. But the truth is, I think by the time we're children having age, we've probably not really discipled anyone. And so the first people we learn to disciple is our children. It's a very intimidating prospect. It's a very challenging idea. The author of that little book, he said, when confronted with this task, parents often resort to one of three freak-out responses. They either overcompensate, they do more than they need to, but they end up kind of reducing faith and spiritual formation to kind of just a set of rules. Don't do this, do this, don't do this, do this, don't do this. And rules are important, don't get me wrong. I would say they're even essential. Jesus himself commanded obedience and love, John 14, 15. But rules really can't be everything. He said, number two, they delegate. And I see this happen especially at larger congregations. They, they mentally entrust the task to another person. Sometimes it's a youth minister. And the parents just kind of hope for the best. And they say, they'll teach my kids how to be faithful. Or they delegate them to a book. Maybe they found a good book on youth ministry. Sometimes they even say, you know, just read the Bible, you'll figure it out. But that's really just delegating too, just maybe to a book instead of a person. Or number three, they dismiss it or they become so paralyzed by the fear and weight of raising up children in the faith that they kind of tend to just blow it off and ignore it and do nothing but think, you know, certainly it'll work out. And I think number three is probably the most popular and the most dangerous. Because I think very, sometimes as parents we can think that, well, well, I'm a Christian, so my child must be a Christian. You know, my, my family goes to church, so surely my child will understand that our family goes to church. Surely they will understand the, the importance of being a disciple. And we think, well, you know, if we just keep going, somewhere along the way, somebody will get them the things that they need to know for their faith. And I think the important thing about Proverbs 22, 6, train up a child in the way they should go, is that that's not a passive process. It's not describing something that's just going to happen on its own over time. But the parents should actually have an active role in training their children in ways of the faith. And so in healthy spiritual habits and practices, through your own actions, modeling the, the kind of man, the kind of woman, or just the kind of Christian you want them to be. And the main focus of our lesson this morning is just going to be two ways that I think sometimes uh, that, that we could be helped by. Two ways that maybe sometimes we get a little bit wrong that I just wanted to address. It starts with community. Last week we studied Titus 2 and we talked about the command to be a, an intergenerational or multi-generational church, which is just this idea of, of being a place where people of all ages are, are not just welcome, but are contributing, are, are serving, are teaching, are discipling, are encouraging one another. The idea that the, the local church as a spiritual community, where we're all pulling together kind of in the same direction, and this idea of the, the church as a, a spiritual community is, is so central. I mean, it is, it is essential to the church that gets laid out in Scripture. There's an old, old saying, perhaps you've heard, that it, it takes a village to raise a child. 
I would say it takes an entire church to instill faith in one. It takes an entire church to instill faith in a child. And this is supported by, by numerous passages of Scripture that we'll look at in a moment, but also several researchers and studies have, have looked at uh, why kids stay in the church versus why they leave, and they've seen this play out. If we look at just a couple of passages on this topic, we would see in Hebrews 10.25, we are commanded to assemble together. And stop me if you've heard this one before. But let us not neglect meeting together, as some have made it habit, but let us encourage one another. And the rest of that verse says more and more as we see the day approaching. I'm sure if you've, if you've grown up in the church and like me, you've heard many, many a lesson on not forsaking the assembly. But what I actually want to point out is this is the second half of that verse that it says we, when we come together, we come together to encourage one another. That we, when, we, when we come and assemble together, our purpose highlighted by this verse is we come together to encourage one another. We come together on the first day of the week as Christians to, to stir up faith to build each other up, to revive our spirits. And so it's, it's a good thing that we're here this morning. And I know especially this weekend of all weeks, we've got some people out of town, we've got people having plans, we've got people doing other stuff, but I, but I hope when you leave, you feel stirred up in your faith. You, you feel revived, that the fire has been lit again in your soul that you can kind of carry with you when you leave. Because it's a good thing that we're here. And I mean, I know, I know on any, any different weekend, we've got... Ten different things going on, right? The families, we got this going on Saturday night. We've got something Sunday afternoon. And there's stuff we got to get ready for on Monday morning. And we probably got to get groceries sometime between now and then. And it, it can feel, it's okay to admit this. I'll say it for everybody. It can sometimes feel like a burden to make it to church. Maybe we're the only family that's ever experienced that. But it can sometimes feel like a burden to make it to church. But it should be when we leave. It should be a good thing that we've been here. We should leave feeling spiritually refreshed and maybe better equipped to take on mentally and emotionally the spiritual challenges that will await us throughout the week. I also have up on this verse, up on this screen, a verse from Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes 4.12 says, Though a man might prevail against one who is alone, two will withstand him. A threefold cord is not quickly broken. Again, when we talk about this idea of the church being a spiritual community, I, I probably pulled out 10 to 15 different verses trying to see which one really... And I stuck with these two. They're kind of classics, I guess. We've probably heard them several times. But I like this, this idea in Ecclesiastes that says if, if you're one-on-one -on -one with an adversary, your chances are not good. <laughs> if you're two-on-one, -on -one, okay, you, you can probably withstand somebody. But if there's three of you, whoever is attacking you is going to lose. So he doesn't have a chance. A three-fold cord is not quickly broken. I'll tell you, just kind of thinking again about my experience in parenting, limited as it is, nothing has made me appreciate the, the, the plight and the struggle of the single mothers out there like being a parent who is one of two parents. <laughs> because I can't tell you the amount of times that we've been through and the things we've been through. We said, I have no idea what we would be doing if there was just one of us. Because truthfully, there's two of us, and half the time, that doesn't feel like it's enough. And so this idea of a three-fold cord, when I think about it in the context of the church, I cannot overstate the role of spiritually sound parents in growing a child's faith. But, if you are the only spiritual role model your children have, they're going to have a hard time. I'm going to have a hard time. And, and in preparing for this lesson, I actually talked to my dad a little bit. because I, just wanted to, I said, you know, am I, just, am I remembering this right or did you say this is pretty accurate? And I love my parents. I have a good relationship with both of them. But there was at least a two-year window. They would probably argue it was more like five. Well, I didn't want to listen to a thing they had to say. Maybe some of you with teenagers who have been teenagers right McCall, this phase of your life. But nothing they had to say mattered. Nothing they had to say could bear any weight. I was quite sure I had everything figured out, and I really just didn't need their direction in my life, you know. And I eventually grew out of that. Like I said, they, they tried their best, and we have a pretty good relationship now. But if you're the only spiritual role model, you've got to understand, you're, you're going to come up on a chasm where they're just going to suddenly wake up one day and decide you don't know anything, and they've about got it all figured out. And it becomes of incredible importance that they have other spiritual role models in their life. I'm not saying it's impossible. I'm not saying you can't do it. 
But even if you're two parents and your, your family is kind of trying to take on that task alone as just an unfamily unit, you're going to have a very difficult time. Christians are called to exist in spiritual community. There are no lone wolves in Scripture. I mean, the most perfect teacher who ever lived picked 12 people. But when Jesus sends out the 72 disciples in Luke, he, he sends them out two by two. In Numbers 11, the Lord tells Moses to, to, to bring together other men in the community, and, and God says explicitly, so that you will not bear your burdens alone. Every description of the, in the New Testament of the church is a description of, of not just believers who are sort of isolated, roaming around together, but of a spiritual community. Acts 2, Acts 4, Ephesians 2.19, Ephesians 4, 1 Peter 2.9, all are verses that describe a, a group of believers that fundamentally exist in community with one another. I would say we need this community to raise up children in the faith. A study uh, by the Barna Group, which is just a Christian research group, they, they found that a vast number of children leave the church between 18 and 25, and you've probably heard this statistic before, and it says many of them do not come back. And maybe you've experienced this in your own family. Either you were a child who left for a while, or you, or you have a child who has left the church. But we can have a whole separate conversation about why children leave, but what they did is they, they, they tried to look for markers between the families who had children stay and the families whose children left and did not come back. And one that they found, at least one very significant one, was that if your children have one to five spiritual role models, connections, relationships, spiritual mentors, aside from their parents, it is a near certainty that they will remain strong in their faith. It says that they found that children need at least one not-parent role model, but if they had five meaningful relationships with adults, and older kids in their church, outside their immediate family, it is almost certain their faith will remain strong. Why? Because I think what they're identifying is the difference between a spiritual community and a bunch of families who just sit next to each other. And I, I know sometimes we think about the Sunday morning as kind of the, being the, the, the pinnacle of the church activity. That's the one thing we do together. But when we're here, are we... Are we really embracing a spiritual community? I hope that we are. Because Christians are called fundamentally, we are called to exist in community. And if the, health, if the local church can foster a healthy spiritual community, our faith and our children's faith will be much stronger. And number two, and don't worry, I don't have three points this morning. Let's be centered. I want to talk about being centered for a little, specifically Christ-centered. This phrase, uh, the nuclear family, kind of became popular in like the, the 20s or something. And it just referred to the traditional family unit, right? Two parents and their children living together in one household, uh, sharing food, finances, responsibilities. And the idea was, the reason they call it a nuclear family is because you have all these individuals sort of orbiting around, circling around this idea, this idea of us as a family. And in this kind of thinking, the health or, or the good of the family is at the center of everything. And this is, there, there's good things to this. That In this kind of thinking, we exist first as a family unit, and then everything we do as a family kind of flows from that, right? Mom, mom and dad go to work. Why do they go to work? Provide for the family. Kids go to school and they play sports so they can learn and they can grow. We, we participate in community events, things like that. And we go to church because that's just what our family does. But I would argue that our identity in Christ should change this just a little bit. Just a little bit. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Colossians 3, 17, Whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of Lord Jesus. And so I think there's a small, subtle difference when we're, when we're growing up with this identity in Christ, and it's that we do what we do not because that's just what our family does, but we do what we do because that is our core identity in Christ. And this seems like a really small, kind of subtle difference, but stick with me. As Christians, being a good family, treating each other a certain way, mom and dad's parents' children, is certainly part of that. 
But, but in reality, everything we do should flow out of that first identity we have in Christ. Everything from what kind of job do we have? Why do we do it? Where do we, where do we live? Where do we go to school? What kind, of, what kind of things are we involved in outside of school? Why do I work the way I do? Well, because I'm a Christian. But why are we involved in outreach in the community? Well, because we are Christians. And why are we a part of a local church, worshiping and studying together? Well, we do that because we are Christians. And so what this means is that, that we do all of these things as long as they first are subject to this identity of being a Christian. So when it comes to things like school, like sports, like bands, like extracurricular activities, that, that means I'm, I'm in those things as long as they allow me to maintain my identity in Christ. And so it's my first identity as a Christian that is non-negotiable. Everything else is secondary. I think one of the reasons that age group they identify when children fall away is because that's the age where children kind of start to no longer be a part of the immediate family. And obviously, you love your children, they're still part of your extended family, but 18 to 25 is that age where they set out on their own and they sort of, they sort of begin thinking about their own new identity as a family. And in my experience, there's a long gap between where they get out of the house and then sometimes there's this revival period where they, they meet somebody, they have a spouse, they start having children and think, wow, you know, I'd really like for my children to grow up in church like I did. And then they start thinking about how that's going to work and what that's going to look like. But because their idea of going to church and being a part of a spiritual family is really, really tied to their idea of being part of a biological family. And it might seem crazy, but I think Jesus' words in Matthew 12 make it pretty clear that actually even above our identity as a family, our identity as a Christian, our identity in Christ is first. This one's not going to be up on the screen. But I wanted to share with you something from Deuteronomy 6. Deuteronomy 6.4 says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. This is a foundational phrase for the Jews. It was a central teaching. They even give it a special name called the Shema. And we've talked about this before. It was really their, their big verse that they put over all other things. But the next few verses afterward describe how God wants His people to treat His words and His teachings. This is from Deuteronomy 6. Verse 5. These words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. You shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hands and they shall be frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. When we read that, some of those phrases might seem weird to us. I'm still not really 100% sure what a frontlet is for an eye. I don't know if I've ever bound anything as a sign on my hand. But God is saying, I want you to integrate these teachings into your everyday life. These tablets of stone, they don't just say, stay written as words in stone that stay up in the temple or the tabernacle. And, and God's teachings don't just stay there. But they, they're the things that you, you talk about in your home. They're the things that you... You talk about when you eat. You talk about when you wake up. You talk about when you lie down. And he's saying our identity, our identity is in God. And we're supposed to bring in his teachings and integrate them into our lives. And I think the danger of kind of having that family identity first is that well, when I'm a child, I, I, I do what I do because mom and dad tell me to. And I can assure you I heard that a lot growing up as much as anybody else did. But it can accidentally lead to this mentality of, well, I go to church because that's just what we do. And there's not really ever a deeper understanding than that. But in this view, in this way of thinking, my identity as Christ is first. And so everything from how we operate as a family flows from that. Our, what role our, our jobs and school play approach, all that flows from that. And, and now in this view, church isn't just something I do because that's what our family does. But I understand that my primary identity in Christ calls me to worship. Because it's a fundamental part of who I am. I understand that I'm a created being, loved by God, 
who longs for me to worship him and be part of his people. As we leave this morning, I want you to be thinking about exactly what it means for your family to have their identity in Christ be first. What it means for this to be the very center of our lives. How does it impact the conversations we have throughout the week? How does it impact our, our schedules, our priorities? How does it affect our approach to worship? 1 Corinthians 12.12 12 says, Just as a body, though one, has many parts, all its many parts form one body, so it is with Christ. If you're a Christian, you're someone who's been obedient to the commands of Jesus in John 14, 15, Mark 16, 16, to repent and be baptized. You're obedient to the example of the church in Acts 22, 16, 1 Peter 3, 12, which means turning away, rejecting a life enslaved to sin in the world, but accepting God's grace and forgiveness, united with Him in baptism. Ephesians 4, 6 says the church is one body. We're united by our one faith, one Lord, through baptism. As we leave this morning, I want you to think about what this means for your family if you're part of the body of Christ. But if you haven't made a decision to become a part of the church, to obey the gospel, to be part of the family built on Jesus Christ, you can do so this morning while we come and while we sing.